um, I, I am uh, oh, recording. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Dr. Noel Schultz, uh, the co-director of the Advanced Grade Institute at PNNL WSU Collaborative. And today we're very excited to have uh, Dr. Wei Du. Uh, speaking to us uh, on small and large signal stability analysis and modeling of grid forming inverters for their uh, for their role in power systems and a really relevant topic right now as we talk about uh, uh, how our, our inverter controlled uh, resources are going to really con uh, affect our power grid. So I want to uh, turn it over to Dr. Du before I do a little bit about him. He is, uh, got his PhD from Tsinghua University in Beijing, and his main areas of research are control, design, modeling, and simulation of power systems with high penetration of power electronic devices. He's currently a staff research engineer at PNNL and serves as a principal investigator for multiple projects from the universe, U.S. Department of Energy, including some models for industry looking at some of these inverter-based uh, resources. Uh, he, uh, his work focuses on the high penetration of inverter-based resources on the dynamic behaviors of power systems, and he is the lead technical lead in modeling and simulation area of the universal interoperability for grid-forming inverters uh, uh, consortium co-funded by DOE, both the solar and wind offices, as well as an associate editor of the IEEE transactions on smart grid. And uh, with that, I will turn it over uh, to him to give us presentation. Thank you, Noel, for the introduction. So it's very, it's a great pleasure to be here to give a talk to students. Actually, it's a, my first time to give a talk to students after graduation, leaving my university. So today, my topic is about the small and the large signal stability analysis and the modeling of grid forming inverters for their role in power systems. So first, I'd like to give a little bit of background of my, uh, by myself. So I got my degree. I started my PhD in 2009 at Tsinghua University. Uh, one thing I'd like to highlight is that at that time, I was involved in a 200 megawatt statcom demonstration project. So I was fortunate to work with power system engineers and power electronics engineers, engineers to work together on the control design, the PS gas simulation, and the finally go to on-site commissioning uh, for the for this telecom. So I still remember the days that I, when I worked with the engineers in the substation to do the on-site commissioning for this telecom to make it real work. So it's pretty uh, unique experience for a PhD student. And But actually, my PhD topic is about microgrid. And at that time, actually, microgrid was pretty new concept, and we don't have too many microgrid projects in China. So I decided to spend, spend one year in the uni University of Wisconsin-Madison at U.S. To, to learn microgrids. Uh, at that time, I worked with my advisor, American advisor, Bob Lester. Uh, I learned a lot for, about uh, microgrid operation and control and also spent a lot of time on learning grid forming inverters. That's where I started to uh, work on grid forming inverters. And uh, by the way, actually, I was at uh, Puma this Saturday at a game between WSU and UW Madison. And uh, for the football game, and the WSSU did a great job. You won and have a big win. Congratulations. What he is not saying is he was supporting the badges. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> and uh, yeah, after my visiting a student at UW Madison, I went back to China and graduate. Uh, and then I, I decided to work in industry first. I worked in the China Southern Power Grid Company for two years. So at that uh, at that university, they have uh, sorry at that power grid company, they have a very big RTDS lab. They model their entire power grid power grid in that RTDS uh, racks, and also that power grid has uh, more than twelve HVDCs in their grid. So uh, at the lab, they also have pretty good hardware controllers of their HVDCs. So I played in that RTDS lab for two years and played with HVDC controllers and learn some experience on the operation of HVDC and the, the analysis of large-scale AC and DC hybrid system. And after working there for two years, I'm kind of missing the environment in the US, so I decided to return to the US. So I went back to Utah Madison to do a postdoc with my American advisor. So that time, I, I continued doing some research on microgrids and started to think about how grid-forming inverters can impact large-scale system. 
And meanwhile, and, and my advisor asked me to test a, a synchronous machine. So I manually test a five kilowatt user generator by, by myself. I test the AVR and even dismantle it. So it also helps me to understand the dynamics of the, of the synchronous machine pretty well. And then later on in 2019 or uh, 2018, I found a job at PL. And uh, at first, I just work on different tasks, but now I start to manage uh, multiple projects, as Noah mentioned, how to study how inverters, how general power electronics in, uh, impact power system, in, in, including some modeling and simulation work, and also some real, real world demonstration projects just recently awarded. So that's my background, but you can see that for these years, I have been fortunate to uh, dedicate myself to the application of power electronics in power system uh, in this research area. Okay, so here is the outline. So for this, for this talk, I plan to use a bottom-up approach to introduce how power electronics impact power systems. So I will start it with a small signal analysis to, uh, to provide an insight into how different droop controls for grid forming inverters can impact the system's small signal stability. And then we jump into the large signal stability to do some transient stability analysis to impact uh, to study how different current, current limiting strategies uh, impact the critical clearing time of the uh, inverter-based system. And then after talking about a single device level control and analysis, uh, we go to the system level analysis. Uh, talk about uh, I will talk about how we use open source tools developed by PNL to build a simulation platform that can study the system with more than 10,000 inverters and to study how these uh, 10,000 inverters impact the system stability. And finally, I will introduce the most uh, recently awarded real-world demonstration project of the 380 megawatt grid forming hybrid plant just in Oregon, which is very close to here. I will talk about, after talk about the modeling simulation, I will talk about the real-world demonstration project. And then I will draw conclusions and talk about the future work. So here is a little bit of background information. So uh, we all know that uh, you know, the renewables and batteries need to connect to the system through the voltage source inverter. And uh, today's inverters, the, the, all, the hardware is the same. They always use this voltage source inverter, but the control strategy makes their dynamic behavior totally different. So there are two main types of controls. One is called grid following, which is at the left side. Another one is called grid forming, is at the right side. And I would say that today, maybe more than 99% grid connect inverters use this grid following control strategy. So what they are doing actually is that they assume the system will provide you a strong grade voltage. And what the inversion needs to do is just to regulate the current inject to the system. Typically, they use a phaser lock loop and current loop to regulate the current. So the advantage of this control is that it's easier to regulate the P and Q inject to a system, but it does not directly regulate the voltage and frequency. And it has to be connected to a strong grid. If you know weak grid or in an identity system, it will have some problems. And on the other side is a, is a grid forming control. So now a lot of people are talking about from the research area. So uh, the grid forming control, basically they make this voltage, uh, voltage source converter, inverter behaves as a voltage source behind impedance. So basically the advantage of this approach is that it can directly regulate the voltage and the frequency so that they can work in a landing mode, the power the load by itself. That's why the grid forming inverters are mostly, mostly used in uh, microgrids first. But now uh, the disadvantage is that it does not direction control the current. It might have some overload and overcurrent issues. You have to deal with that. So to, to summarize, I would say that for grid fall inverters, uh, at the, because they are like a current source, at the beginning of the disturbance, the inverter output currents is approximately constant. And then there might be some external loops to regulate the current reference. But for uh, grid forming inverters, uh, they behave as a voltage source behind impedance. So at the beginning of a disturbance, the inverter maintains their internal voltage to be approximately constant. And there, there might be some external controls to regulate your uh, voltage magnitude and, and phase angle. So uh, this is a basic uh, brief summary of these uh, different controls. We'll talk about more uh, in later slides. And how, after talking about the grid forming inverters, uh, another thing I would like to bring mention about the droop control, because uh, droop control is very uh, important control strategy that allows multiple grid forming inverters to work together in a system. So, and also a grid forming inverter is not just a voltage source, it's a voltage source behind impedance, coupling reactance XL. Then this XL actually is very important for, for controller design because if this XL is well designed from this famous classic equation, you can see that 
P will be approximately linear with the phase angle and the Q will be approximately linear with the internal voltage magnitude E. That means you can still regulate P by changing the frequency of phase angle, or you can regulate Q by changing the internal voltage. And based on this well-designed coupling reactants, so you can, we can use droop control, these classic droop controls to regulate P and the Q and make sure multiple grid form inverters can maintain synchronism in a, in a small system. So the PF droop control is just a very simple negative feedback control. It's very simple, but it can work. So this is just a little bit of background information. And another important thing I like to mention is that uh, the coupling reactance is very important. If this is not very well designed, uh, your droop control will not work very well. And here is a small signal stability boundary. We did from small signal analysis. That shows that a larger coupling reactance allows a larger droop gain to uh, maintain the small signal stability. So this, this, uh, this conclusion will be very important for us to, uh, to compare those two different controls. Okay, so with this, this background information, I think we can dive into the first topic is comparison of two widely used uh, grid forming droop controls. So, so when I was a student, so when I read the papers, you know, you mentioned the droop control, if you look at papers, there are so many different off control strategies, especially in the power electronic society. And uh, so actually to summarize, there are two types of uh, droop controls that I would say that. The first is that the left side, I will call it a single loop droop control or, or direct droop control. This is where I learned uh, in the UW medicine. It's a, it's a very simple control. Uh, it, we call it single loop control because it just has a PF droop control and a QV droop control. Then out, outputs of these controllers directly regulate the, the modulation waveform and uh, do the PLM control. There are no inner loops there. It just looks pretty simple and straightforward. But if we read the paper, uh, there are another type of control called, I call it multi-loop droop control. So they do have the PF and the QV droop controls, but also they have the inner cascaded uh, voltage and the inner current loops to, to generate the waveform. So actually, you no, know, I spend most, most of the time on learning this, but also I'm aware of that this is another very popular control strategy for reporting in literature. So for quite a long time, I, I was confused by those two controls. Are they the same? Uh, are they generated similar results? Or what are the difference between them? So uh, I, I still don't understand it, even when I got my degree. But finally, when I did a postdoc at Udon Medicine, I revisited these two controls, and I think I have a better understanding of these two controls. So for this, for this session, I'd just like to provide an insight into this uh, design philosophy of these two controls, and hopefully that could be useful. So if, I, if we take a quick look, you know, the, the, the single loop droop control is pretty simple. We just have a PF and a QV droop control and then generate the uh, phase angle and the internal voltage magnitude and then we directly regulate uh, do the PLM control. No inner loops. And also we know the coupling reactance is important. So we have the LCL filter. Typically we have L2 larger than L1 because we want L1 to play a role for the coupling reactance. And for the multi-loop control, uh, you know, of course, they still have LCL filter, but in some literature, it doesn't even have this L2. It only have L1, C1. And also, they have the in cascaded uh, inner voltage and current loops. But this, this is just a quick uh, glance, but it doesn't help to explain that too much. But if we go to this slide, so keep in mind that a grid forming inverter is a voltage source behind the impedance. So when we examine those two controls, we need to ask, ask ourselves, where is that voltage source? Where is that uh, coupling reactance XL? So then let's revisit those two controls. So for this troop control, it's the PF troop control generates a phase angle here, uh, you know, angle here, and also the QV troop control generates an internal voltage manual here, and it directly do the P down control. So that means it trades the inverter bridge voltage here as a voltage source, and it then regulates the magnitude and the phase angle or frequency of this bridge voltage. So it's, fun, it's equivalent circuits in fundamental frequency is a voltage source behind impedance XL and XL1, XL2, because the voltage source here and both L1 and L2 should be counted as these coupling reactants. But for this multi loop triple control, so what it is doing actually, they have the inner voltage loop and the current loop to regulate the capacitor voltage. So their inner loops actually make the filter capacitor voltage as an ideal voltage source. 
And then they have outer loops, PF and QV droop control to regulate the voltage magnitude and the frequency of phase angle at this capacitor voltage. So in the fundamental frequency is equivalent circuit is uh, voltage source at the filter capacitor behind this uh, inductance L2. So, so their equivalent circuit is just the voltage source behind the inductance L2. The L1, LC1 should not exist in the control system. So after analyzing this circuit, you will see that uh, for the single loop through control, it has larger coupling reactance because L1 can be considered as its coupling reactance. And also, yeah, they are regulating the internal voltage magnitude and phase angle. But for the multi-loop through control, they are regulating the capacitor voltage and the phase angle of frequency. So only XL2 will be considered as a coupling reactance. And then you will see that uh, the difference in the coupling reactance. And if you still remember that small signal stability boundary, I told that, I showed that a larger XL allows a larger group gain to maintain the stability. So we need to see, to verify if that is accurate or not. So now let's do some uh, eigenvalue analysis. So let's create a very simple two inverter-based microgrids. So now we know the importance of L1 and L2. So for case one, let's assume L1 is much larger than L2. Let's say L1 is 6% and the L2 is 1%. So then we can get the equivalent circuits of these two droop controls. So for the single loop droop control, because both L1 and L2 can com be considered as a coupling reactance, uh, the XL is actually 7%, right? So, but for the multi-loop droop, con droop control, only L1 can be considered as a uh, XL. So it only has 1% uh, coupling reactance. Then we find that doing the eigenvalue analysis for this uh, single loop control, control, the system doesn't lose stability until the droop gain is higher than 9.2%. That means you can set your droop to be 9.2%. That doesn't cause stability issue. In reality, you don't set that high gains. But for the multi loop droop control, if you, with this coupling reactance, the system will lose stability once the droop gain is higher than 2.3%. That actually kind of dangerous because typically you want the droop gain to be about around 1 to 3%. So this can easily cause. Uh, instability. So this is just a eigenvalue analysis. And then we want to run some detailed EMP and uh, hardware and loop testing to, to verify uh, this eigenvalue analysis. So we still have this uh, the same case here. Uh, and we use 1% droop gain. We see that uh, for the single loop droop control is pretty robust. Uh, we don't see oscillation. We do a, a change a set point. But for the multi-loop droop control, we can see that this kind of less damped oscillations. And if we re still remember that stability boundary, we will see that because for the single loop droop control, it has 7% XL, so its, it's point is here. It's far away from this uh, stability boundary. But if we have a multi-loop droop control, it only has 1% equivalent coupling reactance. It's here, so it's very close to the stability boundary. That's why uh, it's less damped. And this is uh, case one. And then for this case, uh, if we increase the droop gain from 1% to 3%, so let's check on this stability boundary. If for single loop droop control, it should still be okay, right? Because it's still far away from the stability boundary. But for the multi-loop droop control, if you increase the droop gain from 1% one, uh, 1 to 3%, it indicates that the system will become unstable. And uh, here is a simulation, hardware loop, PSCAD simulation aligns with this analysis. You can see that for the single loop droop control, it's still stable. We can see a little bit of oscillation because it's getting closer to the boundary. But for the multi-loop drip control, it just becomes unstable because, because of this higher drip gain. So this is case one. Uh, case, let's, now let's analyze another case. Let's, now for this case two, let's reverse the value of L1 and L2. So now for this case, we have L1 as 1%, L2 as uh, 6%. And then if we, with that coupling reactance, we can still calculate their equivalent coupling reactance, right? For single loop drip control, it doesn't change too much. It's still 7% because both L1 and L2 be considered, uh, can be considered as XL. But for the multi-loop drip control, it becomes different because, because only L2 can be considered as a coupling reactance. For this case too, their coupling reactance is actually 6%, right? It's pretty high. That means that these two controls should have similar response on their stability boundary map, you can see they are close to each other. And when I do a small signal a time domain simulation, you can see they give, give a very similar dynamic response. That just shows that how this 
coupling reactants, equivalent coupling reactants can impact the uh, small signal dynamic performance. And then if we increase the drop gain to 3%, uh, again, they are still very similar because they have a similar uh, coupling reactants. And if we go further, we go to 9%, this is, uh, this is an extreme case. So on this uh, boundary map, you can see that a single loop drop control is still stable, but the multi-loop control becomes unstable because they still have a smaller coupling reactance because one is 7%, another is 6%. Uh, on this map, you will see that the, the, the single loop drop control is still stable, but it becomes very less than, but the multi-loop drop control is still, uh, becomes unstable. So, so for this work, just want to, it's not about to, this presentation is not about to derive all the equations to get eigenvalues. It's just more like to provide, provide an insight to understand the uh, control philosophy of these two, uh, two controls and help people to understand, analyze the behavior. And eigenvalue analysis is just a tool to help to verify and explain the, this phenomenon. So with that uh, uh, insights provided, I think we can analyze some behaviors by ourselves without running the small signal analysis. Because these days I heard people saying that the, uh, the grid forming inverter has problems in strong power system, but it's work well in the weak system. And I, I think that depends on how you design your control strategy. So let's consider this case. If you have a multi-loop group control grid forming inverters, without L2, only L1, C1 connect to a strong grid, as, as assume this is strong grid. If you use multi-loop group control, then their equivalent circuit becomes one ideal voltage source connect to another ideal voltage source. No cutting reactance between them. And if you know the circuit theory, you know, basically two voltage source cannot work in parallel. So that's not going to work. So that's why some people are saying that when you grid forming inverters, you have problems in strong grid. But if you consider the, if you use the, the single loop to control, then there, this L1 will be in the, in the circuit. So there should be fine. So that means it depends on how you design your control strategies. Uh, before we make that statement, grid forming inverters have problems in the, the strong grid. So we need to analyze the behavior of control strategies by, by ourselves. So that's what I mean here. A better understanding of the control structure matters more than just the tuning the parameters. We need to understand the fake physics first. Okay, so this is the first section. After talking about the small signal stability, so now let's talk about the transient stability. So actually this is even more difficult because small signal stability is just one operating point. But the transient stability, we need to consider the transition uh, for different modes. It's more uh, complicated. So here, provide a little bit of background information. So power systems are dominated by single machines for many years, hundreds of years. And the people have developed a very classic theory to understand the, the transient stability uh, phenomenon, different very classic theories to, to understand this kind of phenomenon. One good example is the a famous equal area criteria. Right? So we have a synchronous machine connect to the grid uh, to the, uh, through a line. So if you have a fault here, and we can use this very simple equal error criteria to calculate the critical clearing time and then predict the system stability. So that's a very classic theory that helps uh, provide insights into this trend and stability phenomenon. And the swing equation is a key dynamics for this machine-based system. So now, now if we replace that synchronous machine with an inverter-based resource, okay, so everything changed because the dynamics, the dynamic, dynamic equations of a synchronous machine, uh, whole inverters is totally different from the synchronous machines. And then how we understand the, the trend and stability phenomenon. If the fault happens in the system, if we clear the fault, is there a critical clearing time or not? How do we understand this phenomenon? And here is just uh, some simple simulation results. Let's consider a steel group control with a simple current limiting control for this converter. And we find that if we apply a 0.1 second fault, uh, after the fault is clear, the system is still stable. Its phase angle increase a little bit, still go back to the previous value. But if we apply a delayed clearing fault, like 0.4 second fault at the right side, we will see that after the fault is clear, it gives, gives you some weird behavior. And also we find that the phase angle cannot return to the previous value. It just go to another value. So this is some weird behavior. So this is just simulation results, but can we, can we understand the, the, uh, the, this different phenomenon and get some similar equations to predict this uh, instability? I think that's pretty uh, interesting thing in my mind. So we need to do some analytical studies rather than just running simulation. 
So to, to do this analytical studies, we need to start with simple examples, not very complicated system. So let's just consider a grid forming inverter use the drip control, as I mentioned, uh, but without current limiting control. Just use a very simple, very simple droop equation. So we can perform an analytical study. And uh, with this power angle curve, we'll have found that, we have found that now the critical clearing, time, uh, critical clearing angle becomes point B. If we have the init initial p-set, and based on this power angle curve, as long as the fault is cleared before this point, point B, the system can always be stable. But if your fault is cleared after this angle there have been, and then your phase angle cannot go back to its previous value. So it becomes pretty, uh, pretty simple. And also that implies that this critical layering time as actually is larger than simple the machine, right? Because simple the machine's critical layering angle is somewhere between A and B, but now it's droop control is just at point B. And, and then we can do some uh, simulations for this case is that so we apply a fault before, uh, if the fault is clear before this point B and the phase angle can still go back to its previous value, the system is stable. But if the fault is clear after point B, you, you know, your phase angle cannot go back to its previous value, it transitions to another value. It's, it's still stable, but it can experience a larger uh, trend in the behavior. So then, then this, this analysis is very simple. However, it has a, it has a very unrealistic assumption because if without current limiting during the fault, you can see this inverter generates up to five or six per unit overcurrent. That's not for today's inverters because today's inverters only have less than 1.5 per unit overcurrent for most of the cases. Then we need to go further to make a more realistic assumptions for uh, current limiting the fault rise through control of grid forming inverters. So actually this, this is a very important research topic for grid forming inverters because if you control them at a voltage source, we need to consider how to limit their current during the faults. And there are a different kind of current limiting controls. Some use the current reference saturation of inner loops, and some use virtual impedance, some use outer loop, uh, outer loop to limit the current. So there are different, many different uh, current limiting controls. Even including my team, we are publishing several papers on this area about current limiting control and fault rise through control. But this talk will not talk about the fault rise through control. We mainly talk about how to analyze this behavior. So because we need to analyze this kind of transient behavior before we understand that, then after we understand this phenomenon, we can start to design our own controllers. So for this, this talk is meaning to analyze the transient stability uh, of a grid forming inverter, uh, single, single inverter infinite bus system. So here we use a very uh, kind of simple uh, current limiting uh, method. It's called a uh, priority based current reference saturation method. Basically, once it becomes overcurrent, we use the inner current loop to, uh, to limit, uh, saturate the output current. And also we use deep priority, that means uh, the phase angle of the current align with uh, the angle from the droop controller. So this is what we call the uh, deep priority based uh, current limiting approach. And then we need to perform some analytical studies. So still again, we have this uh, droop controlled grid from inverter connect to the infinite bus system with that current limiting. And then we want to analyze how this phase angle changes uh, on this curve. But now the thing is that uh, different is that we have two curves, not just one power angle curve. Because during the fault, it goes into the current limiting mode. So its power angle curve becomes this its brown curve. So there are two curves we need to analyze how the phase angle transitions between those two curves. So actually it becomes a little bit more uh, complicated. So, so let me try to explain it in a uh, few sentences. So the initial operating point is at point A, and then if we apply a fault there, the terminal voltage drops to zero, so it moves from point A to point B, and then your output power becomes zero. But your droop control is still governing the, the phase angle. So that phase angle is keep increasing from point B to point C, and point C, we clear the fault, and then the terminal voltage recovers to its previous value. However, now, the phase angle between the internal voltage and terminal voltage is pretty large. So pretty large, and if you use that equation to calculate the out output current, this output current is still in the current limiting mode because it will exceed I max. That means after the fault is cleared, it doesn't go to this previous blue line, it go to this brown curve at point D because even after the fault is cleared, it's still in the current limiting mode. And then, but fortunately, uh, point D, the output power is larger than P set. 
So my phase angle will go to the left side to reduce. And, uh, and then when your point, uh, the phase angle keep reducing at some amount, uh, at some uh, value, the phase angle is small enough. So it will quit the current emitting mode and go back to its previous point at point A. That's why you know, during this entire transient stability analysis, uh, after fault is cleared, it goes to current emitting mode and then quits the current emitting mode and go back to previous operating point, point A. So this is the whole process of how this, uh, how this phase angle changes uh, during this fault and before, during, and after this fault. And here we can run a, a time domain simulation. Here I just show the current and the phase angle. You can see that um, at the very beginning it's at point A and then after fault is clear, it's still in the current limiting mode for a while. And the, when this phase angle keeps uh, decreasing at point E, close to point E, and then when the fault is cleared, it's go back to its prior value, point A. And with this analysis, we can easily get an equation to predict the critical clearing time. So based on this curve, we can get the expression of this critical clearing time is 0.49 seconds. Uh, for the simulation result, it showed that uh, the uh, critical clearing time is 0.51 seconds. It's very close. But you know, with this understanding, that helps understand this, to analyze this kind of transient uh, response. So here is the section conclusion. You know, the, the transient stability analysis is performed on a single grid from inverter in the bus system to provide the insight of this kind of instability phenomenon. So that actually helps us to design the, the advanced uh, fault aggressive control of grid forming inverters. As I mentioned, a synchronous machine has a critical clearing time you can do nothing with that because that's just machine physics. But for inverters, you can flexible change your controls to, to avoid that critical clearing time. You can avoid that. It doesn't, it can, doesn't have critical clearing time. But understanding this kind of phenomenon, phenomenon helps you to design your controller to rise to this kind of force to avoid this critical clearing time. Uh, maybe next time we can talk about this control design. But this, this talk will give an insight into this kind of transient stability phenomenon. Okay, so in the previous two sections, we always talk about uh, in a small system, in a small microgrid, in a single inverting thing bus system, how this kind of controls impact your small signal stability and, uh, and transient stability. But in a real power system, there could be millions of devices connect both that transmission and distribution system. Especially nowadays, you know, the boundary between transmission and the distribution system is blurring. Many inverters are connected at the distribution level. And in the practical, in the future power system, we can imagine millions of these devices connected to power system. So how do we understand the dynamic behavior of such a complex system with potentially millions of these power electronics devices connected both on the transmission and distribution levels? So here, uh, from the modeling simulation uh, perspective, we want to see if we can have some good tools that allow us to do some simulation to evaluate the system uh, stability. So you know that at PNL, people have spent years on developing some open source tools uh, to study the system dynamic stability, including the transmission level simulation tool called grid pack and distribution level simulation tool called grid lab D and some interface co-simulation engine called Helix. So what we are doing is that we are using these three tools to try to connect transmission and distribution system together and uh, run co-simulation. So, for this case, what we are doing is that at the left side, we model the mini wax system uh, in grid pack. It's an open source tool built, developed by PNL. So we model the mini wax system. And the right side, we model the distribution feeder. It's an 8500 node test feeder, distribution feeder modeled in grid lab D. It's a, another simulation tool you might be familiar with. And then for each feeder, we can add 550 inver 50 inverters in each feeder because that's reasonable. You, you, you can imagine hundreds of inverters in your, in your feeder. And then how do we interconnect them together? For, for this mini wax system, it has 19 load buses. So what we are doing is that we replace each load bus with this 8500 node test feeder. So there are totally 19, uh, we replace total 19 load buses with these feeder models. That means we created the system with more than 10,000 inverters in the system. And also the system has actually 160,000 node, uh, 160, node nodes. It's a very, a uh, big uh, integrated transmission distribution system for, for dynamic simulation, not for static state, it's for dynamic simulation. And then uh, this is about simulation platform. And then I'll talk about the models. So we, we, we have, with the simulation platform, we need to have the grid form inverter model or some other inverter models to, to do the simulation. So recently I'm working heavily with industry 
including uh, mainly the WAC and also software vendors web developing inverter models for for industry to use to help utilities understand how grid firming inverter impacts system. So this is a, a WAC approved grid firming inverter model specification developed by PNL. Uh, this is the first uh, WAC approved grid firming inverter model and also is the first time WAC adopted a model specification uh, developed by national labs. This work actually was quoted by uh, Secretary of Energy on Twitter. And uh, basically, this is just a very simple group control grid forming inverters model. And this model, we can use this model to uh, evaluate uh, how grid forming inverters can impact the system uh, footprint response. So with this simulation platform developed, so what are we going to do? So we, we try to address two questions. So the first question is, okay, so if we still continue using existing grid falling inverters in a system, so how many grid falling inverters can the the system hold. So we started from, uh, we just did some penetration level studies. Uh, we started the, uh, the, the base case where we don't have inverters, we have 100 sequence machine based system and we studied the system frequency response. And this black dash line is uh, the original system response with no inverters. And if we keep increasing grid falling inverters in the system, we can find that the frequency needle point keeps dropping and at about, uh, 80% we find the system become unstable and also we see the 35 hertz oscillation. So that just, the simulation just shows that at this penetration level of grid falling inverters, the system cannot maintain the uh, stability. And then the second question is that uh, we know grid forming inverters are important. So how many grid forming inverters are needed to maintain the future IVR domain system? So, so starting from this case, we find that when we have 80% uh, grid falling inverters system become unstable. And starting from this case, we start to replace some of them with grid forming. And we can see that for this ground curve, if we replace uh, around 5% grid falling with grid forming, it becomes stable again. And also the frequency data point improves a lot. And if we keep increasing the penetration of grid forming inverter in the system, the frequency is more stable and uh, 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 the, the definitely no stability issues. And finally, if we go to 100% inverter penetration with 12% grid forming inverters, we can see that the system is even more stable than the original machine dominated system. Because now all, for this 100% inverter based system, there are no machines. So no machine dynamics anymore. We, all the frequency response is governed by the droop control. If you know the droop control, when a step change in the power, your frequency just follow the droop. It's very stable. So that's why we will have 100% IBR case with even 12% grid forming inverters. The system actually stability is significantly uh, improved. And also use this platform, we can identify a stability boundary, but I will not talk about all the details there. And finally, you know, I talk a lot about uh, model simulation analysis, control design, maybe. And here I'd like to introduce a uh, recently award, uh, real world uh, grid forming inverter power plant demonstration project because recently I closed, uh, collaborated with industry a lot, especially in the WAC utilities. They are super interested in this, this concept. They want to see what happens in the real world. So recently we got a project awarded uh, to at the 380 megawatt weight ridge plant to demonstrate the grid forming technology. So this site is pretty unique because this is the only site in the US to uh, North American to combine solar wind and battery storage together at one location. So we have everything, solar, wind, and storage at this one site. And also, this also, if successful, this will be the first time that the grid forming technology, including both a battery and a wind, being demonstrated at the transmission level because we have grid forming inverters for microgrids. But this time we will demonstrate the grid forming inverter connect to the bulk power system. This is a system one line diagram. Basically, we will change a portion of the type three wind turbines to grid forming and also demonstrate the, the battery as grid for me. So this is our project team. This team was led by Portland Gen Electric. And also we have GE as the manufacturers and BP as system operators and the next year as a, uh, as a plant owner. So PNL will be working with them together to, to do this demonstration project. We are very excited about this real world demonstration project. Okay, so, so let's go to the conclusion. So for this section, uh, this seminar, uh, we analyze the small signal stability behavior of two kind of group controls to provide insight into their control design principle, and also analyze the transient stability of a single grid forming inverter in a bus system. 
Uh, that can also provide insight into designing new fault resistance controls. And also, we're, we perform simulations on an integrated TND system with 10,000 inverters and also uh, and identify the stability boundary. So I think for this area now, it's pretty active. There are a lot of open questions need to be explored and need to study. Uh, I just need to list a few topics. Now, I think a current limiting for grid forming inverter is an important thing. So, but we also need to understand how, how different current, means, uh, current limiting strategies impact the trend of stability of the multi-machine, a multi-inverter, multi-machine system. Can we still get some analytical studies? We did the analytical, analytical studies for a single inverter infinite bus system. Can we extend it to multi-inverter, multi-machine system? I think that would be interesting. I don't know if we can get a good analytical studies there or not. And also, this kind of uh, fault rise through control uh, current limiting strategies will impact the system protection design. This kind of control and protection interaction will be something uh, to be uh, studied. And also, in the future, as I mentioned, there could be millions of devices connected to a system. We, we showcase that we can use this simulation platform to simulate system with more than 10,000 inverters. But if you really want to go to millions of devices, that's still, I think there's still a long way to go. And also, we should not just uh, do the high fidelity simulation. We also need to do the uh, appropriate aggregation, uh, aggregate models to capture the dynamic behavior. But how to do that? I think that's still an open question. Okay, so that's uh, my presentation. Thank you. Great, great presentation. Thank you very much. And and time for questions. He gets a gold star for that because some of some of our speakers go way right up to the time. So um, I want to open it up to see if there are any questions. And I'll check in the chat and I'll see anything in the chat. <clears throat> Thank you very that is interesting So I, I really like the first part you were actually all parts, but the first part as well. So that one when you compare the cascaded uh, yes. controller and the single loop controller. Yes. So uh, just one observation I just wanted to mention that. So uh, basically in the cascaded one, so in the single loop one, so basically yeah. what you do, you use that algebraic equation and basically based on that you design the controller such that you get the reactive power and regulate the amplitude of the voltage. Yes. But in the uh, cascaded one, you consider the whole dynamic of interaction between that capacitor and the inductor yes. and design the controller such that the voltage actually so therefore the dynamic of that is much better than because the single loop basically you are controlling reactive power. But in the cascaded one, you are controlling the voltage load. And then you supplement that one with the do control of reactive power. So therefore, what I'm trying to say that that's from a small signal stability, that's true. That is because of different structure. But also I think it's the fair comparison should be you don't get the same quality of the voltage control in these two algorithms. So therefore, I can play around with that cascaded controller and come up with the kind of less uh, precise voltage control such that I get increased small signal stability, but that, with less quality of the dynamic of the voltage. That, that is possible. So it depends on the the simplicity and the complexity. So for this control, the control philosophy is that is regulating the capacitor voltage using the, the closed low high bandwidth voltage current loops. I want to give the very ideal voltage waveform at the capacitor, but the sacrifice is you have to well tune your inner control, control gains to achieve that. And also the under equivalent circuit is just voltage source behind this XL2, right? If with, L, with no L2, this becomes an ideal voltage source. You have very good control of your voltage uh, waveform. That is very good for the islandic operation. If I supply the load, the power quality for this voltage load quality is very good. But we'll connect them to the system. Then it becomes complicated. You need to consider the interaction between how to tune these inner control loops and does that cause any oscillations, uh, potential oscillations with the rest of the system. Uh, but you can always play with the tuning of these controller gains. 
But for this one, it's, it's uh, kind of simple. You know, I don't need to play with tuning those parameters. I just directly control my internal voltage. And I agree that uh, you know, this just behave an inversible uh, voltage, source, voltage source behind both X1 uh, and L2. Actually, you have a capacitor here because it's still in the, the system, we ignore it. From the power quality perspective, if you connect a load to the system, it might give you some harmonics there. Uh, but even the, the dynamic of that voltage you get is much worse than the other one. In this the left-hand side, the voltage, if you look at the dynamic of the response of the voltage over there, because over there you are using the basically algebraic equation. Yeah. But in other one, you are basically designed based on the dynamic response of the system. So that's why <clears throat> you get the ideal voltage source. Yeah. Right hand side. But in the left hand side, that's true, the, the small signal stability increases. Yeah. But you don't have the same quality of the voltage dynamic response compared to other ones. That, that's a good point, but I think it depends on what kind of voltage you, you need. Let's consider a simple machine. Simple machine is a voltage source, not an ideal voltage source. It's voltage source behind your subtransient reactance. You have XD double prime here. The value is about 70%, right? So that simple machine doesn't give you an ideal voltage source. Maybe this one can give you, but uh, that can cause oscillation issues. Depend, depends on which one you want to use, right? If, yeah. Then you have to play with, basically yeah. your, your uh, takeaway is that don't make it too good. So there is a trade-off between them. So this one is easy to, if you test them in the real world, you will find this one is difficult to tune. Sure. Uh, because sometimes the inverter p-line frequency is dropped to three kilohertz. And then the interaction between the p-line control current loop and voltage loop becomes complicated. This one is just uh, the plug and play easier. And also we'll talk, talk about the voltage quality. There are standard requirements like, you know, you have 3% harmonics that is allowable. You don't need to achieve 0%, right? You, it's some standard. As long as you satisfy, satisfy the standard, that's, that's good enough. Thank you. Thank you. I had a question uh, about similar to Dr. Lutz. If the single loop is simple and if it provides better stability, then why is the multi-loop popular? So why you, you, that? you see that popular in, in papers. Do you know what, what OEMs really did there? You don't, right? Actually, I can tell you many manufacturers they are using this one, the left, that left one. I can, I can tell you that. <laughs> you, you see a lot of fancy stuff in the paper, but in reality, it may not be the case. Because if you really want to tune this, uh, this control in your, your product, if your p-line frequency goes to three kilohertz, that's not easy to tune your control. The interaction is very complicated. And also for this one, actually, and also I talked to a manufacturer recently. They, they thought this one is better because the multi loop is more advanced. But then when they do the test in the field, they realize this, this response is better. <laughs> they change back to this one. It's not the more fancy, it doesn't mean fancy one is better. Sometimes the simpler is better. And also, I can tell you, I'm collaborating with GE on developing some models. If you look at their, based on their information, they don't have this. this you know, some, sometimes they have. The reason they have is that their legacy devices, they always have a current loop. They want to leverage that. But that doesn't give a good reason to me because you need to design a better controller rather than le leveraging your legacy stuff, right? So that's something. <laughs> you see a lot of in paper, but uh, OEMs never tell you what they did unless you closely collaborate with them. I have another question on the core simulation platform that you mentioned. Yes. Uh, so is it uh, an EMT-based simulation or phaser-based platform? And how much of a difference would it make to choose either of them? That, that's also a good point. So uh, this is a definitely phaser-based simulation. You cannot run EMT simulation for this kind of system. Uh, and also, that's that's a big question uh, industry is asking, you know, should I go to full EMT simulation with high pen penetration of power electronics? Uh, or the existing PSSC, you know, trans simulation is still good enough. Uh, I think that, that it also relates to the control strategy of inverters. So, so we know that uh, if we use simple machines, you don't need EMT simulation to study the dynamics of simple machines, right? The PSSC is good enough. Uh, but, but if you use great fall inverters, uh, that involve the fixed allowed loop and the fast inner current loop that will give you some weird oscillation. You cannot study that in PSS. You have to go to PSGAT 
EMT to capture that kind of phenomena. Uh, but for grid forming inverters, now I, I think something is different from grid falling inverters. Grid forming inverters are many, in many ways very similar to synchronous machine because it's voltage stores behind impedance. So if you design the grid forming inverters very well, you don't need uh, PSI to simulate that because it's more like a synchronous machine. And uh, based on our recent work, you know, I collaborate a lot with uh, the software vendors industry on getting these models, including the commercial tools. We did a very rigorous comparison between PSSC and PSGAD for with forming inverters. And show that it's very, uh, the result is very close. So, so that what I mean is that if we go and more and more single uh, grid forming inverters, we, mon we may not have to go to VM simulation. PSSC might be good enough because Grid forming inverters are many sim are very similar to simple machines. But if you have more and more grid falling inverters, those weird oscillations probably cannot be captured by PSS. You have to go to 3 MP simulation to study that. Is that because of PLL or something? Uh, I think uh, it's mainly about the, the interaction between the PLL and the inner current loop. Because grid falling inverter itself, the hardware is a voltage source converter. But you want to make it as a current source, you have to use a fast inner current loop and a phase lock loop to, to regulate the current. But when the system becomes weak, uh, you, you just cannot work it, make it work very well. So that causes some problems. So, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah. Other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Uh, so thank, thank you so much for the presentation. So I just wanted uh, to like clarify maybe a, a few things which you stated. I, I didn't uh, properly understand. So one, you uh, regarding the uh, case studies. Yes. So you you mentioned a 10k uh, strong uh, PND system. So uh, and you also mentioned like you mentioned like there's a simulation and like there's also a real test grid. So did you like implement it or the like? Uh, run it for the real test grid or anything. Oh, no. You just mentioned that, like I just got confused on that. No, no, there are two separate things. This is a simulation platform for us to examine how different penetration levels of grid forming inverters can, can impact the system stability. This yes. is just a purely simulation based. And, and this one is a, a recently awarded the real world demonstration project. Uh, so this is 380 megawatt power plant where we will change it has 300 megawatts of wind turbines. We'll change a portion of wind turbines to grid forming yeah. and do the real world demonstration. Those, those are two separate things. Yeah, yeah awesome. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, another thing. So, when we say that, uh, so for example, in your simulation, you said that 80% of grid forming, you said grid forming or grid, grid falling. 80% of grid falling will cause instability. Yeah, yeah. So, when we say 80%, that's 80% of the load, or is it 80% of the uh, generated by the synchronous machines? It's it's, uh, it's a generation uh, capacity. All right, so you yeah. mean like only 20% will be, I mean, you are not changing uh, the existing machine. synchronous yeah. generators, right? Yeah. You are still letting them stay. No, no, I, I oh. trip them off, I oh. turn them off. Yeah, okay. yeah. so the, that's a generation capacity. So, oh, so right. the generators are not online. If they are still online, I guess the system is still, still stable. So what I'm talking about, we, we replace the machine with inverters. All right, all right. So you mean like 80% of the uh, entire generation units? Yeah. Yeah. All right. And just just one more thing. So uh, and when you uh, for this simulation, like uh, so, this was done in grid pack. Uh, like I'm not. Yeah, yeah. Some sim. Uh, it's it's uh, actually we use three simulation tools. The transmission system is grid modeled pack in grid, grid pack. pack. Yeah, grid right. transmission is modeled in grid FD. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, what is uh, like an uh, appropriate model of an existing synchronous machine you use, like to? Uh, you mean a synchronous like machine? What model? Uh, I'm just. Curious. No, uh, synchronous machine model is basically what is used in the commercial tools, like you know, GenCell. Okay. Uh, yeah. They have the governor exciter models. They all model. Yeah. 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 That, that's it. Yeah. Thank yeah. Thank you. I think we got time for one more question. Nobody else has a question. You're going to ask him over lunch. Well, that's right. so, yeah. oh, there you go. Did you try to like do this simulation in a real time uh, scenario? This this one no. <laughs> I, I don't know if this real this can be run in real time or not. No, I, I didn't do that. Okay. But uh, maybe. Uh, I mean, yeah. I'm trying to see the the size of the RTDs that would actually accommodate this 
Yeah, so I, I actually work on the real-time simulation of RTGS when I work in China, so I'm part of a company. That that's, that's a platform has 33 racks, okay. and we model about 1,003 buses uh, in, in that system using 33 racks, and we can run it in real-time simulation. But here is about 160,000 buses. Yeah. I don't know how many resources <laughs> are in that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, let's thank Dr. Du for his presentation. So great, thank you very much. So uh, I think uh, for the graduate students, uh, lunch is available and you have the next hour to, to visit with Dr. Du. So um, we'll uh, turn it over so, to uh, that. Lunch together, right? Yeah, lunch, <laughs> lunch together right here. You don't have to move. You just stay in the same place. So, uh, <laughs> oh, it's, a, it's a, like a maze. Have to be very careful. Well, yeah, we, well, 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 this afternoon, they'll, 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 uh, <laughs> hey, Darlene, can you stop the recording? Oh, she's on the phone with Van Ann. Um, it doesn't, it's not letting you stop it. No, it won't. She's, um, 